Welcome back, my friends, to another episode of the Shema Podcast. It's time to begin talking about Pesach, Passover. And I apologize in advance for those of you who have been listening for quite some time, because I want to say something that I've said over and over again, but there are many new listeners joining this audience, and I want to make sure this is conveyed to them as well. Our holidays are not about solely commemorating a historical event. These times throughout the year are replaying themselves over and over and over again. And they have significant repercussions for our growth and our mission here in this lifetime as a Jew. So that is one. We are going to be experiencing something similarly to what our ancestors experienced thousands of years ago, but many of us come into Pesach not knowing how we got there and without knowing where we're going. You have to remember as we approach Pesach that the Almighty is the one that enslaved us in Egypt to begin with. He wanted us to be enslaved by another man. And so as I look back over this last year and contemplated Was I working for another human being or whether I was working for the Almighty, I realized that at many points in time, I was in the headspace that my livelihood depended on another man, a Pharaoh. And through that recognition, I realized it was time to go back to the foundational roots of my learning and restudy the chapter on trust in the book, Duties of the Heart. And what was the purpose of this enslavement? It was to instill in us a sense of utter humility and of service so that the Almighty could train us to be a worthy servant to Him. Now, when we talk about Egypt, or the Hebrew word for that, Mitzrayim, and the mental restriction, is our Yetzer Hara, our evil inclination. And what does it want? It wants to distract us. It wants us to be focused on this world and think that's all there is to our existence in our lifetime here. So what is our Pharaoh? What is our captor? What is our Yetzer Hurrah trying to get us to avoid? And it comes down to where we are going once we found ourselves once again in Egypt, in Mitzrayim. But the first part of the process is cleaning out the chametz from our home. And when Pesach arrives, only eating matzah, it's removing the chametz from within us, our ego, our sense of pride. It's eating matzah. It's infusing ourselves with humility. And so as as we tell the story at the Seder, as we go through the Haggadah and we see about the 10 plagues for the Egyptians, the 10 miracles for us, and we remember that Hashem, our creator, is the only power. He controls everything. Once we have that mindset, we are humble. We know he is the only power. Then we are ready to begin our journey. And that's why Passover, our Pesach, is just the beginning of the journey that we will go through. But where are we going to? Where we're going to is Shavuos, the giving of the Torah. We're going to Mount Sinai over the course of 49 days. But there's something we hit on those final two days of Pesach, that moment in time at the original Exodus from Egypt and every year since is we hit the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea, and faced with Pharaoh, the evil inclination coming after us, and faced with physicality, a sea, we have a choice to make. What happened at the Sea of Reeds? The Almighty did not actually just part the water for us as is shown in the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. What happened first was Nishon knew that's the direction the Almighty wanted him and the Jewish people to go. Now, everything his mind told him, everything he knew, was that humans could not breathe underwater. But he knew that that is the pathway. That is the where the Almighty wanted him to go. So he just began to walk, even though logically it made no sense. And as he walked into the water, until the water got up to his nose, 
It was because the Almighty is above nature. The Almighty created nature. The Almighty interacts with us through nature. And because he was so connected to the Almighty through pure amuna and a pure sense of service, regardless of whether or not those actions made any sense or not, that connected him with the Almighty so much that the water had to move out of his way. I learned an amazing insight from Rabbi Lazinga, and that is that the water did not immediately split to the other end. The water was moving back each stage as they moved forward. It was his amuna. It was the Jewish people's amuna and the Almighty to move forward, to go against physicality, to go against what nature, go against what their thoughts said is possible. That is what caused the water to have to move out of their way and let them go through. That is the Mitzrayim. That is our mental restriction. All the things in the world, all the physicality, everything we say that can't happen in our service to the Almighty, when we make that our focal point, we are above nature. And then with that amuna and that humility and that knowing that God is the only power, then we're ready to move to Shavuos and accept the Torah, to accept our covenant with the Almighty. Now, I found that the majority of Jews out there celebrate Pesach. They have a Passover Seder. But the majority of Jews are not even aware of what Shavuos is, and they don't recognize that holiday. So what is happening? They have the first night of Pesach. They have a Passover Seder. They spend the next week walking out of Mitzrayim. They get to the Sea of Reeds, and they stop, and they meander. They don't know where they're going. And Pharaoh and his army, the Yetzirah, comes and grabs them and pulls them back and puts them right back where they were the prior year. This year, my friends, we're going all the way. We're going from Pesach and we're going to Mount Sinai. We're going from freedom to true freedom, which is accepting the Torah. This is such an important point in time for us as a Jew. So I want to implore every Jew listening who had a Passover Seder, but did not use that as the starting point of a journey that ends at Shavuos to come with me this year. I thought long and hard about who would be the perfect guest on the Shema podcast to discuss this. I knew I needed to go all out. I need to pull out the big guns. Now, I know you're probably thinking, oh, you got Rabbi Yokoff will be on again. Isn't it nice, Dan, that you have such friends in high places? But no. Think bigger, guys. This year, I'm pulling out even bigger guns than Rabbi Yokoff will be. This year, I'm bringing his sons back on, Akiva and Yehoshua will be, and they are going to teach us the pathway from freedom to Mount Sinai. Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories, as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars, demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. Welcome, Akiva and Yehoshua Wolby. The audience, I know, is excited to have you back. I think it's been a year now since I had you on last. Yeah, something like that. And I think that out of all my episodes, that I got the most positive feedback from you guys. You think it'd be like Nassim Black or your dad, the Rabbi Yokoff Wolby, the podcast star. But no, it was you two. And that's why I knew I had to have you back on the show. So probably a lot's changed over the last year. And before I have you bring us up to speed on the last year since you were on the podcast last, for those of you who are new to listening to the Shema podcast last year, when I had these young Sadiqam on, I introduced them as my spiritual big brothers. And the reason I, I said that they were my spiritual big brothers is because their father, Rabbi Yokoff Wolby, is my spiritual father. Many of us have a father that brings us into Olam Azay, and then someone that comes into our life and brings us into Olam Abba. And since Rabbi Yokoff Wolby is that person, he may say, don't speak so fast, Dan. We haven't gotten you there yet, but at least he's the one that's having the biggest influence and always has it getting me there. But if that is the case, if he is my spiritual father, then... Akiva and Yehoshua are my spiritual brothers. And considering they have grown up, lived from day one in such a holy environment full of amuna and Torah wisdom, 
They are definitely my spiritual big brothers. So welcome back, gentlemen. I would love for you to each take a moment and just bring the audience up to speed. What's gone on the last year since we spoke last? Nothing's really changed except like I've grown a lot taller. Um, I have a new brother. It's my last year in the school that I'm in. But overall, everything's pretty much the same. Yeah, not much has changed. I've got gotten bigger and the new brother. And your new brother's name is? Yisrael Mayer. Beautiful. I think you are now taller than me, Akiva. Is that is that true? Let's stand up real quick. I want to check it out. Considering I'm your big brother then. Yeah, it's true. You're, you're spiritually have always been taller, but now we are physically the, the same size. But I doubt by the time I bring you back next year, you will be towering over me looking at the uh, stature of your father. So let's get in this. Such a great, important time of year. And growing up like I did, and a lot of Jews did, in a very secular environment, there's a lot that gets left out of the importance of it. You know, the, the purpose of Pesach or Passover becomes about, it's a time to get family together, which is a fantastic, of course, aspect of it. But the deeper meaning and why we're doing that, we need to pull that out and, and share that with them. So if you could just share with me and talk about like this time of year, as you approach Pesach, if there is a change in the atmosphere of the Wolby home. Yeah, well, on Pesach, you're not able to eat chametz, so or like bread. So what you do is you need to clean the whole house uh, for Pesach, and you can't use dishes that you were used with chametz unless you tevel them, you make them pure. But it gets like more stressful. We move all the chametz into like one box. We have a box that's our chametz box. And everyone's, every, something's always happening. People are cleaning, pulling apart the dining room to like clean all the like the nooks and crannies. All right. Now, are you guys responsible for your own room and going through your clothes and backpacks? Clothes, not really, but backpacks, yes. And like, like last night we did like the, the table and chairs. You have to like pull apart the table because it's like has multiple pieces. It's like go through everything like with a fine tooth comb. Go through every single piece of everything. So everyone's involved in the Wolby Home yeah. in this project. A lot more participation and much more work. Well, most stuff we just lock up in a closet, like tape over it and like make a sign, no, you can't open this on over Passover. And we sell, you sell that to a non-Jew. Okay. So over Passover, the non-Jew owns whatever's in that closet. So for all we know, there's a loaf of bread there. And the non-Jew owns that, so it's not ours. Right, okay. And then afterwards, after Pesach, we buy it back from it. So I'd like to hear from both of you on just sort of a general big picture. Why is Pesach such an important time a year for a Jew? For those who have maybe not really understood the, the depth of Pesach, what would you say to someone if you were trying to talk to them and say, like, why this is such a big deal, what they should be focused on, why the Almighty wants us to do this once a year? Because this is our beginning. This is where we came from. This is our redemption, our exodus. It's like our founding event. Where Moshe and Aaron, they Moses and Aaron, they they took us out from the greatest nation of that time. The super, super powerhouse. And we were nothing. We were the slaves. And they, they were like Persia when the, at its prime. And nothing could stop them. And then these the small B'nai Israel, they overtook them with miracles that... No one has seen before. So why do you think the Almighty wanted to put us in servitude under Pharaoh and then do all these incredible miracles and then pull us out again? Probably to like show how great he was, make like a grand entrance to the Statement. to the coming of uh, Har Sinai when we got the Torah and is like trying to show everyone don't mess. Like, do you mess with us, you mess with God. He'll do this to you. You're saying it, it basically shows, he wanted to show the Jews and the Egyptians. And everyone else what, what he could do. Yeah. Don't mess. He is, he is the ultimate power. And I assume it was before going to Mount Sinai that the Jewish people, after being beaten down by being slaves for so long, they needed to, to know that as well. They were like on the 49th level of lowness. 
And then God brought them up to the 50, 50th level and he spoke to them. And he brought them back down to overpace. Actually, he brought them back down to level zero, like even. And then during the Sphere to Omer, Sphere to Omer, they count up one, it's 50 days until Shavuos. And Shavuos, back when Shavuos, when he gave Matzah Torah, when he gave us the Torah, those 50 days are bringing up to it are one level higher, one level higher, one level higher. When Yitzhak from Sarim, when he took us out of Sarim, we were at the lowest, the lowest of the low, like one level lower, we would have been done. And then Hashem like jolted us from, from all the way down to the highest level of purity. And then after that, we went down to even. And then every day we just climbed up one, one step, one step, one step, until we finally made it to the ultimate Kedusha, ultimate holiness at Har Sinai. Okay, so first basically the Almighty pushed us up to that level and then dropped us back down and said, now get there yourself. You know, this reminds me of, there was a, there's a saying in the military, I think maybe it's the Marines, about how they, they tear men apart. They break them down, right? And then they build them back up again, stronger. And it seems like maybe that's what the Almighty was doing. Okay, any other thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's our rebirth. That was the beginning of the legacy. The main thing you start from it was Moshe took us out of Egypt from the greatest army that was ever there, and then we were nothing, and he just brought us out. So the Almighty maybe is wanting to show us, because we've had to be reminded of this throughout history, that no matter what powers exist in the world, we are under his supervision, and we should have nothing to fear when we're under his supervision. That's comforting right now, to know that we, we do what we're required to do, we live within the confines of Halak, and we follow the Torah, and the Almighty says, I will protect you. You have nothing to worry about. Is that sort of an idea there too we can take right now when the world gets a little scary and you see these despots and these these maniacs and like Russia and everything? Okay. Now, why is it called a Seder? Which is the, the English translation I've learned is order. What is the purpose of to go and experience Pesach or Passover by having a Pesach Seder or order? You can look at it from many, it has many different facets. You can look at it from so many different ways, but I'm just going to say one way where you can just look at it and look at it as life. Life has its own crazy, seemingly, seemingly crazy order, but like it's really God orchestrating it the right way. And when Chazal instituted this order of A, B, C, D, right. that was like the perfect, that's the perfect, perfect way. No one, there's no, you can't like add, add to it, can't take from it. It's like perfect, perfect, just like how God orchestrates our world. Yeah, but another easier way is th- there's no order. It's Kadesh, Orchats, Karpas, etc. Right? You might say, oh, we have to wait so long. We've read so many words and then we have to eat. Why can't we just eat before everything? We're starving, right? Right. Because there's a specific order and this order has to be followed. You sort of touched on this already. Maybe you want to elaborate a little more. One of the things I mentioned in the introduction is like the majority of Jews out there celebrate Passover. I mean, I, I, I think I shared last year when we discussed Pesach how when I first started becoming religious, I was out of town at a conference, started talking to someone, and he asked me, are you Jewish? And I said, yes. And he said, so am I. But then he immediately said, but I'm an atheist. And I said, okay, fine. So we started talking more, and I, I just started talking about business. In the back of my mind, thinking I wanted to come back to this. And after we, I got his mind away from it for a little bit, I just sort of came back and casually asked, so what are you doing for Passover? And he said, oh, Passover. That is the biggest time for my family. I fly all my family in to my home in New York, and we have this big Passover Seder. And like, it's so important, even though he had to declare immediately, I'm an atheist, but there's something that just compels a Jew no matter what about Passover. And I was sort of saying like, but most Jews don't know about Shavuos. And it's and if you really look at it, this is a whole journey we're going through, right? It starts with Pesach, but then it goes through to Shavuos, right? It's like it's these things are all connected to one another, and you sort of already discussed that, Akiva. I'd like to see if you had anything else to elaborate on on why Pesach is the necessary initial step to, to get us all the way to Shavuos and the acceptance of the Torah. It's just like a good way to start us off, like having this abundance of miracles and you see God's on your side. 
and there's, you're, you can't, can't be stopped, and then you just keep on going higher and higher and higher. It's a good way to kick up, get a good kickoff, and then keep on going all the way to Shavuos. Okay. Yeah. Like you said before, it's like counting the steps towards Shavuos. But also, you can go back and like, Shavuos is technically when we got the Torah. So, it's like an order. It's literally going back in the day. Pesach happened in Nisan. And it goes, and then on that day, it's like the days in Shavuos. It's like the happenings back then. What happened then? It's just happening now, and we're just celebrating in different ways. Gotcha. Okay. Let's go through when we're sitting at the Passover table, and we're looking at the, the Seder plate. Let's go through each item on here. What does it mean? Why is it part of this time of year? And let's start with talking about matzah. So matzah, it shows us after the 10th Makkah, when all the firstborn starting to die, pa- Paro's like, okay guys, he told Moshe, he's like, get out of here, I can't stand you guys anymore. First, you made everything the blood, and then the frogs. You're, you're, you're killing us, come on. So it's like, don't even wait for your bread to rise. You have to leave, leave, leave. So it shows us the speed of the exodus, how we had to bake it really fast, so it had to be like really flat, because it didn't rise yet. It also shows us that matzah, it says, it's poor man's bread. So when it says poor man's bread, we're like, why are we still eating this poor man's bread? Yeah. So we can say, before we left time, who were we servants to? We were slaves to Paro. So we ate this poor man's bread, right? Okay. So then why are we still eating it? We're like kings, right? Yeah. So it's like when we left Mitzrayim, we transitioned once we were servants to borrow, and now we're servants to Hashem. We're still like servants to Hashem, so that's why we still eat the poor man's bread. All right, let's talk about the uh, Mara and the Chazeris. It comes to te- the Mara comes to like this, like our pain and our sorrow, and Mara's, yeah, it's bitter, and it t- shows us our pain and our tears and our in slavery back in Egypt. So by eating that, it sort of is that... Reminiscing the old, the, the old days when we used to get whipped by these people. And when, so we eat this bitter herb, sort of like to, to show this is what it was. We were like bitter. It was terrible in Mitzrayim. So it's like a, this is like a, a different type of learning that Hashem wants us to go through. Like normally we just sort of like, you study Torah and you're like intellectualizing everything. Here it's, you know, he's wanting us to intellectualize it, but also to make it experiential through all these things. Okay, get us in that, that state of mind. All right, let's, uh, who wants to tackle the next thing on the Seder plate? I'll do it. Okay, go for it. So, charoses, it's like made out of like apples and some other things. Mm-hmm. But so it's sort of like to counteract the bitterness a little of the mar to show us that even with the bitterness we are slaves Hashem was still with us the whole time when Paro made a decree that no more kids they would go out the husbands didn't want to bring kids into this world right right so the wives would go out and have when they were when they were giving birth they would go out and they would go give birth under the apple trees in like the vineyards and stuff like that because that's when they went and that's like showing us how we even through the hard times we were still what we were supposed to do. We were still striving. Do what Hashem said. Pru or vu. Be fruitful. Do you have kids. This reminds me, Rabbi Lezinga just told me last Sunday that there's a midrash that they would give birth under these trees. I didn't realize it's an apple tree. I didn't realize that's what ties in to the horosis. But that then they had such, the women had such a muna that they would leave them and then Hashem would basically raise these children. But the other idea you you discussed is something that we can definitely all take in our lives. And that is we have what seems bitterness, right? We all have challenges and things that come up, but at the same time, what God's t- trying to tell us is there's sweetness there. Like we can't see what, what he's orchestrating, but just to know and have trust that we'll see eventually those hard times, there's, there's sweetness to them because he was just sort of orchestrating something for a greater good. All right, what's, what's next? Who wants to tackle it? 
It's the Zoroa, the roasted bone. It's it's the roasted bone. It's called a Zoroa. And the Zoroa, it's it's called it's a thing that says Zoroa to you. It says Hashem took us out with a strong hand of his right into it with an outstretched arm. So this like roasted bone sort of shows like the outstretched arm trying to bring us out. Uh, okay. But also we can also, tie, I think we can tie it into the Karban Pesach, the offering, the Pesach offering. Was there any significance to that particular animal that they brought as an offering? I think like they tied it to a bedpost, and then they put the blood over their doorways, and that's and God knew once He saw the angel, the angel of death. I'm assuming once He saw the blood stains over the doorways, He didn't during the Makas Barcharos, the killing of the eldest son, that He didn't touch them. In the Egyptians, from what I understand, they worship sheep. So there's got to be some tie-in. I appreciate any insight you had here on why Hashem wanted us to take the animal that the Egyptians worshipped and then turn it into a nice barbecue and offering to him. Any thoughts? It's like, we're, we're killing your God. Look, your God is like a sheep that we eat. We're able to eat your God. Awesome. Who's got the next one? Uh, so the beitza is the roasted egg. So the roasted egg, that and the zroa, the bone, It's they're both a uh, remembrance for the Two carbonos that we lost. The two carbonos that we weren't able to have, right? The Chagiga and the the Karban Pesach. The Zroa is the bone, and that's for the Karban Pesach. And then the the Beitza, the egg, is for the lost Chagiga. Now, there, there's something about the roundness of the egg. Have you learned anything about that, that we should be contemplating during Pesach? Maybe that, like, everything's like a circle. Every, what goes around comes around. Yeah. The people on bottom, Hashem can make on the top, and the people on top, He can make on the bottom. And, yeah. and like that. Right. Just like that. All right. So what, what's, the, what's the last thing on the Seder plate that we need to understand, guys? It's Karpas. It's one of the, not only is it one of, like, the sh- sections, Kadesh or Chatz Karpas, it's, it means it's a non, we take a non-bitter vegetable, it literally means celery, and I think we like, dip it like in salt water, just like during the Seder, we do it also. But that's... It's one of the orders. It's Kadesh. We do Kiddush. Orchats, wash your hands. And don't and, say Bracha. And then it's Karpas. You dip the ve- vegetable into the salt water. And why, why is that? Why do we dip in salt water? Yeah. I think it's to remember our tears that we cried in Egypt. What, what, what's with making us remember such difficult times? And get bummed out and sad, remembering how difficult no, things were. No, we're not being sad. Look at this. We're, we're literally, that night we're royalty. So why, why are we constantly, why does Hashem want us to go through this process where we're eating things to remember how yes. broken and bad we, in a bad state of affairs we were back then in Egypt? Because Hashem wants to show us, look, you were crying, you got beaten, you got whipped, and then what are, you should have been destroyed and now look look what you are. You're spread across the whole world. It's not able to happen again. Hitler tried it. Other people tried it. But they just can't do it. Maybe instilling a sense of gratitude. Yeah. yeah. Towards Hashem, because like, we we're so, so low. And now God brought us back up where we are now. Because it's hard to be grateful for something unless you can visualize not having it. Like we've, you, know, you guys have had, it's a great place to grow up, you know? And so you, and until you can sort of picture yourself once a year not having this amazing community, then when you imagine not having it and being in that place where... So you recognize what good you have in your life. Exactly. Let's tackle the four questions. Okay, so the four questions, it's, it starts off, why is this night different from all the no- other nights? Manishtana halayla hazem bikalalelos. So the, it's showing us why is this night different it's because on other nights we are chametz. It's not we're eating matzah. Other I mean, nights, matzah. other nights were not leaning. Now we are leaning, right? It's like showing us how how is this night different from all nights? And then it says one of the other reasons is like it's like to arouse the children's cu- curiosity to like like get them a little more involved. Okay. And so th- that's something that comes up a lot of times in the in the seder. It's like to 
to make the children a little more involved, to like get their curiosity. Okay. Okay, so what's the, the next one? Uh, the four sons. So there's four different sons. There's the Chacham, the, the smart one. He's wise. And then there's the Russia, the evil one, the wicked one. He's like, I don't want to do this. I don't want, why are we part of this? And then it like answers everyone because you need to do this and this. And then there's the Tom, the one who's like... He's simple. He's simple, he's yeah. Like, he's like the simple one. He's a simpleton. And then, then there's the... He's like, what's going on now? And then there's the... The, the small one. He doesn't know how to act. And that and we need to spell it out for this one. And so... we need And we need every single one of these to have like a functional... Functional Seder. Yeah. It, how, it, each one of these has their own reason for the Seder. Would you say that there are some Jews who are one or the other, or that we, all of us in our life, sort of pass sometimes between one of these types? I'm sure everyone has, like, their stages where they're, like, where they're just simple, and then there's... I, I think everyone go first, first, for sure goes through their in a show, like, that first stage. And the keep simple up, one, but, simple one, they also probably go through... And the next two decide where their life's going to lead. So, and, and this also talks about how to connect with Jews at their different stages where they may be, correct? Yeah. And the, the thing is, there's like four different types of learning. Okay. Um, and so you need all of them. So you need all these things to help have a good Seder. To, ha- to have a meaningful conversation. Yeah. But then the Russia, yes. What's going on here? Why are we here? What are we, what are we doing? I want to go back outside and watch video games, play video yeah. games. And he also says, says here in the Haggadah, that he says, why do you do this? It's not us. He's sort of in that state of mind, like <laughs> distancing himself. Okay, so I was the, uh, I was the Rasha. Because when I was growing up, I was like, why are we doing this? We don't believe it's not true. I'm sure you're thoroughly confused. You weren't, you weren't the Rasha, you were. No, but I was in that state because I didn't believe any of it was true. So when I, my family say, let's sit around and have a Seder, I was like, why are we doing this? You know, and then there's, and then I'm sure there's times too where there's, there's parts of our Yiddishkeit where, you know, our rabbis tell us and our teachers to do certain things and maybe we want to do those certain things. Maybe not right then and there, you know, yeah. uh, we rather, there's times where we rather just play and do something else uh, where we sort of distance ourselves. That's, that's something for the rest of, for you guys, for you guys, right? I'm not part of this. I'm not part of this. And so... There, there's there's those moments too where, or where you may be notice that one of your friends are doing that, right? They're pushing back on something, and now you sort of know how to how to how to talk to them. Which is what it, what does it say? What is the way to um, to approach someone who's not really wicked? There's no wicked Jews, yeah. you know. It's just they for whatever ignorant. reason. Ignorant. He's the ignorant one. Yeah, they're just sort of they they don't understand the reason why they're not connected to it. So, um, so the Haggadah gives some, some guidance on, on how to approach it because we're all, we all want to, you know, every Jew is connected. We're all in this together, right? And we need to know how to approach other Jews when they find themselves in, in different states and places to, to keep us all connected and together. It says in the Haggadah, it's because of this that Hashem did so for me when I went out of Egypt. For me, but not for him. If he, he was in the Egypt, he wouldn't. He wouldn't have been out because he's he's being ignorant. He's like, this this isn't for me. I'm pretty sure, like the Rambam says, that only twenty percent of the Jews left in the time, and the also when the Mashiach comes, only twenty percent of Jews are going to be going, and I'm and like, but like twenty percent of Jews means pretty much all of us, everyone that we know, because not no one that we know is is Russia. We all are Shomotar, Shomotar mitzvahs. We all go by the Torah. But, but those, there are some people that are so far that, that are part of the 80% that won't end up coming. So we have to bring as many people as we can to the, 80%, into the 20%. Exactly. And I did ask your dad when I learned that if it's a prophecy for the future that's not favorable for the Jewish people, then it doesn't have to come true. It's just a warning. Which means if we're on our game, if we learn how to approach each type of Jew... Yeah. Then we can we can, we can do flip it. We can do a hundred percent exactly. That's what we should go for. No no man left behind. So the simple son is not really necessarily stupid. From what I was reading, 
in the book I mean In the Heart of Fire by Rob Moshe Weinberger uh, on the Haggadah, Simple Son is actually a very lofty type person. You know, just pure Muna. Maybe he's not sophisticated in his thinking, and his, but he takes everything very simple. Appreciation, falls what Hashem wants. But yet there's a different way of approaching them than the, the wise, the super intellectual. Now, the son who is unable to ask, how would you describe someone who's unable to ask? Maybe like a newborn or just... Or like a five-year-old, he's like, he doesn't know what's going on, right? Maybe he went in class, but so maybe like a three-year-old, he's probably able to ask. He's like, can I have a cookie? He's probably able to ask. But it's, 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 I think it's like saying he's like not a very high intelligence. He's not, maybe physically, but I know like, you know, 20 years ago, before I knew anything, I'd, I wouldn't even know what questions to ask. You know, I think maybe there's an idea here that... So maybe you, people who are like, they could be 40, but they would still fall under the the category of Shayna Yadel Ishel. He doesn't know how to ask. Maybe just because he doesn't know what to ask. Right. So maybe when we, when we find those people in our life, we help them find the questions. I think this is sort of providing that roadmap to get us to 100% when Mashiach comes. Because there's really, like I said... I don't. I can't remember who said this. I, I want to say it was someone told me it was the Hoson Ish. Hoson Ish, yeah. Yeah, he said like there's no evil Jews in our generation. There's just those that that are ignorant that that were brought up and they just don't in know darkness. Right, exactly. Gemara said the Gemara says that you can't. It's a cut yelich nishba. I think so. I think I said it. I think that's the term. What's that mean? It's it's like a little a little kid that was kidnapped. Okay. We can't. And let's say even if he eats pork, we can't hold him to that because from such an early age, he was brought up. That was his life. Also, yes. people who are in monasteries, people of Jews who got sent to monasteries, such as uh, over World War Two. Right. Or in the Spanish Inquisition, they're like five, six year olds. They can still remember Shabbos meals, but they're surrounded by everyone who's doing something else. So they just merge with them. Maybe they fought, but they couldn't stand it for that long. Right. That is the line, actually. Thank you for reminding me. He said, there's no evil Jews, just captive children. That that was the line, which you can't hold someone like they said that they became captive to be responsible for their action, which is why they're, they're not judged for being in such a situation. Okay. So now that we are equipped to communicate not only with other Jews, but when you get older, not you guys, but I know me, I sort of go through each of those stages. There's parts of me that are probably all four stages. For sure, me also. And so it's like, how do we talk to ourselves when we're in that different state? I think this is giving us, uh, the Almighty's giving us a great recipe for this. All right. Why do we break the middle matzah and hide the larger half for the afikoman? Who's got this? Okay. We break the matzah. And then we hide the larger half for the afikoman. So there's two answers. Either the one who which is, is came up before is like to get the children involved. They need to find the afikoman because a lot of families have they hide the afikoman, and the children need to find that. If they find it, they they get the afikoman. They only give it back to their parents when they get like. They get, they'll get like a present for getting that becoming. It's sort of like a blackmail, lot, blackmail, so to speak. To so, so we're teaching the youth blackmail yeah. technique. Okay. <laughs> they just, they and just take it like you thing. take it, you hide it, and you say, "Okay, fine, you know what? If you don't buy me this rollerblades, I'm not gonna, I'm not giving it back." Oh, you're, you're stepping up the ante. Okay. Yeah. The and, going but, but you can't be. Do you, do you need it back? Because you can't end the meal. Right. You can't end the meal. And you also, it's also for dessert. You need it for dessert. It's like part of dessert. Maybe you have your ice cream and your cakes. But like part of the dessert is matzah. It's the last thing that you eat. Yeah. The afikoman. And afikoman, that, that's what it means. I've just I read recently. It means dessert. I didn't even know that. So why hide the larger half? Why the larger half? Yeah. I think to, I, I was learning a couple days ago that... So it's like the geula. It's like the geula is like the matzah. We we want we want the geula. Wait wait. Translate or, that term real quick too for the audience in case they don't know the term. Geula is salvation. 
uh, it's like the Mashiach when it comes, it's Geula, the salvation. Okay. So we, what, what do we want? We want the bigger salvation. So we, we want the bigger peace. So right. Bigger. Okay. It's like hiding. It's like if you have to choose where you want the bigger half, do you want it like right now in this world where we're in exile? Or do you want it in Ohava? Right. Exactly. Okay. Very nice. So, Akiva, you're gonna you're gonna start off. Let's go through each of the plagues. What does it mean? What first off, what happened? What did it look like? What did the Jews experience back then? Tell us what you know about the the first plague for the Egyptians and a miracle for us. Right? Depends on whose vantage point you're looking at. The the Egyptians they served multiple gods, right? One of their gods was this Nile. It's it's a juggernaut of a river, and they. When they when they're serving this river and they're the the it's like they're mocking them the the Hashem's mocking the Egyptians by saying what oh, this that's your God come on and he's just destroying one thing and the next but like in the olden times that that's what they their fields their infrastructure their out their everything their, all their commerce was done through yeah, this that's they, how they it, become wealthy and they they how do they how do they water their fields how do they take a bath how do they take a shower how do they brush their teeth how do they go to the bathroom. That's that all they did that was all because of this Nile. And once it does that, it just it hit a hard spot. Like it did some good damage. It collapsed the whole their whole life ran on this Nile. Right. It was this whole idea of that was their source of all their tremendous wealth. Are they the most wealthiest country in the world at time? Yeah, um but also there is with the thing, the Makas each words were, were like for six days, right? Yeah. So what would the Mitzrayim do for water? They need water, right? So how do they live? They can drink blood. So what they did is they would go to the Jews. Since the Jews, they drank, their water was water. Wait, wait. How, where do they get their water from? Even if they took it from the Nile, if they take a cup and they fill it up with blood from the Nile, it switches. It switches. So what they did to the kid, he's like, he's like, hey, I'll buy that water for 25 cents. It, it wouldn't work. But if he's like, hey... You see that massive water, the ball of water that's this big? I'll give you ten thousand dollars for it, right? Right. So he gave it to him. So he gave him, and then it turned to water. So another way that the Jews came out with like tons of riches. This this was like a starting point to like f- make their bank account look a little. They uh, the, the only ones. It's like you guys always see these. The Egyptians wanted water. They had to come to the Jews, and that was it. Yeah, but the the price were like exorbitant. Like the prices were like so blown up. It was like so expensive. The Jews were gouging them. Yeah. The poor Egyptians. Okay. Well, poor, really poor in multiple ways. Then number two, plague number two is frogs. So after the blood, the uh, they're like finally we got our water back, and then out of their beloved now turned back to normal Nile River, came out this massive frog. Some people say it was like a crocodile, or there are crocodiles there, but we'll go we'll to the frogs. There's one huge frog. Yeah. And so then Mr. Mike, what is this mutant giant frog doing here? So they took some of their sticks and they, they were smacking it. And then, um, and then out of his mouth, he like just spewing frogs everywhere, everywhere, so many frogs. And there are so many frogs, and then all they're like going everywhere. They're they're going into houses. You could you couldn't sleep. The croaking was like deafening the noise. Why frogs though? Like maybe also like it's not. Like and frogs, there's also you don't think frogs, frogs. You don't think frogs are are gonna like annoy you, right? A frog. Okay, so kick it out of the way, right? Now imagine a hundred thousand of them. And that's in just your bedroom. They're like they're like all over you. They're like crawling into your pajamas. Not scared. They and they they were going into your bread. They would get baked. They would like get. They would some of them would jump into the fire, into the fire and like in for oh. kiddush Hashem. And then there was like and I don't remember, but something happened to those frogs. Yeah, I know. Uh, when the when when all the when Moshe and Moses and Aaron when Pharaoh was like just get them out go go get them out of here Moses and Aaron's like okay. They got rid of all the frogs, but then there's no frogs left, right? And all the ones that went into the fire, they came coming right back out. So it's not like they, they didn't die. What, what happened there was like a mystery. Wow, amazing. Okay, what's next? Lice. Lice is like, it's kinim. It's, if you've never, under, if you ever have like an itch, you just itch it, okay, tomorrow it's gone. 
but these they literally went inside their bodies. So those are itches you cannot itch. Oh, that would be miserable. It was. And there were millions of them. And also... The, they were the size of eggs, supposedly. Like, eggs or olives, I don't remember. Olives, I'm pretty sure. Because right? they're really they were small, and there were millions of them. So, and it shows us it shows us how many lice were there. There were, like, so many. It was, like, a foot. And you couldn't, like, get down to the ground. You were, like, walking on lice. Oh, okay. And also, uh, Yaakov, when he died, he didn't want to be buried in Mitzrayim. There were, like, three reasons, I think. Um... One reason was that when Tachiyas Amesim at Mashiach, when all the dead people will come alive, then he didn't want to roll all the way to Eretz Yisrael, so he wanted to be buried in Eretz Yisrael. Another reason is when Kinim lice, he didn't want lice to be crawling over him. And then the third reason is because he didn't want the Mitzrayim to worship. Okay, wonderful. Wild beast. What type of wild beast? All sort of animals. Any animal you think. Every single animal in the world, I'm pretty sure. And Tons of animals. I think there were also some that were not ever seen before. When I was went to Disney with my family, we stayed at the Animal Kingdom Resort. You walked out on your balcony and there was giraffes and all these animals going around. That was pretty cool. But this doesn't sound as pleasant as that. Imagine they're trying to kill you and they're like <laughs> lions. Going at 40 miles an hour and they're chasing you. Right, okay. All right, in the, in the pestilence, what is that? It's, I think they killed all their crops. Okay. And all their animals. Oh, not crops, yeah, animals. All the animals that were outdoors. Moses and Aaron warned, warned the Egyptians, like, keep your animals indoors, otherwise they're going to die. Very simple. And all their cows, all their infrastructure, it just... Was that the hail or was that the pestilence? Hail also killed everything that was outside. Yeah, yeah. Hail we'll talk about later. Okay, okay. Okay, so the pestilence kills everything in the fields, destroys, again, their food supply. Not their food, their animals. Their animals, okay. Which, which is, the animals are their food supply. That's their well. That's where they get their, yeah. their clothing from and their, their, their food, the meat, the milk. Okay. Number six is boils. So your, uh, all the midstream, they had these massive boils all over themselves. And all the doctors, they're just pouring all their medicines. Nothing would affect this. Like, even if you knew how to cure one... I think there were 24 different types of boils. If you knew how to cure one, to a different one, it, it made it worse. So anything you try just hurt more. And so that the big motion, motion, motion stop. And so he stops it after. And soon later, it goes to number seven. Okay. Hail. When you see the hail, it's like small, it's like marble sized. It hurts if you're outside, but whatever, five minutes, ten minutes is done. Yeah. But these hail, this is... I don't know how big it was. I think it was like the size of a refrigerator. Okay. It's a big hill. It's very, very big. It's the size of like a refrigerator. That's right. huge. And inside it, inside of it, it defies natural nature. There's fire burning inside this ice encasement capsule. of ice. Ice capsules with fire inside. So it was so like... It, it hits the ground, it cracks, and all these trees, everything gets burnt. Okay, so they're like being bombed. Pretty much. But now what? Now and then all the all the animals that the Mitzrayim brought inside, the, the small amount of animals that they brought inside, they weren't warned this time. So all the animals outside and the the ones that were inside in the pestilence, they all died. So now they have no more. No more animals. What's happening? To the Jewish people. Jewish people are living life easy. Wherever they were, they were staying. Goshen. And go okay. And Goshen was totally protected. Yeah. Nothing happened. I'd say a uh, non into Goshen because he's like, ah, then they're not getting in hell. I'll just so go over and he goes. He hill. goes. He walks into Goshen. Uh, ice ball, f- it a hell flies on him. Doesn't touch anyone else. Well, wow. okay. All right. What's next? Locusts number eight. So locusts the yeah. evening. Yeah. Sometimes there's a swarm. It like eats everything. Never seen locusts like these. These locusts. It's like you couldn't see so many locusts. They like can't tell a night between day. And they it, they were just like it's like you took a vacuum and just like sweeped everything up. There was nothing, any any nutrition, anything. The wooden posts on your gate they, got eaten through. To this point, the Egyptians had nothing. Nothing. Okay, who's got the the next one? Um, it's nine darkness. There was two different phases of this darkness. Okay. The first phase is three days, and then three days. Three days. The first three days. Was you couldn't see, you can't see, and in the second three days you can't move. So the first three days were 
the they were just plain dark. The ones you couldn't see very simple. And the second set of three days, not only could you not see, but you couldn't move. And the Jews, they could just walk around, they see everything, and they're like, they like, oh, all the Egyptians' money just lying there. Let me just go and just take. They just see. Hashem told the Jews, don't take it. Just see. Okay, I see behind this picture. There's a safe. Cool. And, and it tells, says the code. Nine, 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 right? Right. And so he looks at the code. He's like, oh, yeah. And it's like, Good thing to remember. Oh, here's where you hide the keys to your Lambo. Oh, now I know that. <laughs> this is where you keep your gold. Okay. And that, that will help soon, as we'll see. So then the, in the final plague? So the final plague was the plague of the firstborn. And then all the firstborns, every single firstborn in Egypt just died. In the middle of the night, they just all died. So, uh, Paro, he's like, he's, he runs to Moshe. He himself was a firstborn after all, so. Oh, he what? Pharaoh was a firstborn? Okay. He's like, Moshe, just get out of here. Get out of here, right? You don't even wait for your bread to rise. Gotcha. Get out of here, right? Okay. So he goes, he goes and Moshe's like, no, we're going to wait until the morning. Because we, we don't want to look like we're like robbers, like just like sneaking out in the middle of the night. Right, We want to okay. look like we're like going out like style. So next morning, Moshe tells every Jewish person, go, and you sh- remember in Choshech, you were looking at where everyone's money is, He's, so go to that person where he saw his money is, and go say, hey, you know you're, um, you're, you're safe behind the picture? Everything that's in it, give it to me. And they got so much money, they were rich beyond rich. They, they didn't steal, but they, the Egyptians were, were, were. inclined yeah. to want to give it and yeah. send them on their way. So thank you, gentlemen, for going through that. Any final thoughts, words of wisdom you want to share that can help us all have a more meaningful Pesach? Nothing really, but like just just do it. Just do it. Okay. Yehoshua, anything, any other parting words? Yeah, like Akiva said, uh, just do it. Have a great Pesach. Have a good Pesach. All right. Great final parting message from my esteemed guest when it comes to Pesach. Just do it. Thank you, gentlemen. You have an amazing Pesach, and we all, and me and the audience, appreciate your time. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.